Hi, I'm Mark Green. Welcome to the Lyman Spitzer Jr. Planetarium Online. This week, we're gonna feature the skies of late June, which has a number of interesting stars coming up into the skies. We have Scorpio, the Scorpion, Summer Triangle coming up in the eastern skies as well, and there are some planets to look at. Now coming up in the evening skies, we have the brilliant planet Jupiter joined by its cousin, so to say, Saturn. So those are all highlights that we'll be taking a look at. Uh, so to do that, we're gonna give our chance to give you a chance to see the sky as you might see it using our planetarium program that we call Stellarium. And this is something that you can use. You can download this by going to stellarium.org and it's a free download and it's a fairly easy program to use. So we've set things up. You're looking in the evening sky and we're looking toward the west and you can see the glow of the sun just all behind this tree right here, just about to set. We are, of course, near our latest sunsets of the year, and so it doesn't head below the horizon until about 8.30 or a little bit later. So we have a long evening before it actually gets dark, up 10.15 before it gets completely dark. If you have some sharp eyes and maybe a good computer screen, you may see a little something over here. Uh, this is the thin crescent moon. It's just beginning to show up. Uh, you'll see it even perhaps before sunset. This is set up for Tuesday on the 23rd. So starting from there and going forward, you will see the crescent moon in the evening skies. But let's get it uh, a little bit later in the evening and let the sun set here. There they go. As they move, it, things are moving fairly slowly at first. You can see this little shade of light disappearing as the sun heads below the horizon. And there's the crescent moon. Maybe we can zoom in just a little bit closer so you can see the crescent moon appearing here. Now, it takes, like I said, a, a fair amount of time before it actually gets dark. So with the sun setting at around, uh, say about 8.30, Plan that about 9.15 or so uh, to start seeing some of the early stars appearing. And indeed, uh, you can see a few stars appearing here. It's about 10 minutes after nine. Let's pause our motion here for a moment so we can talk about those stars that are appearing. To the right of the moon, fairly bright, but very close to the edge of the sky, your last views of what we know as the twins of Gemini. We have Castor and Pollux, the two twin stars which mark the heads of Gemini. Where's the rest of Gemini? Well, it's below the horizon. Really, the time of year to view Gemini is in the winter and spring. By the time we get to summer, it begins to disappear. Now, Gemini, you may recognize as one of the horoscope or zodiac constellations, and that's actually fitting very nicely with seeing the moon here. The moon is always in the horoscope or zodiac constellations, and in fact, transitioning from Gemini that you see here up to a pattern of stars and a fairly bright star showing up. This star named Regulus, it is part of Leo the Lion. It's a little higher in the sky and certainly a little easier to see than Gemini, so let's focus in on that. We'll actually take our view out a little bit, work our way a little bit more toward the west, and Leo is actually pretty nicely positioned here to the uh, upper left of the moon. You can see, and then we'll maybe just get it just a little bit later at night so you can see the stars against a slightly darker background. As that happens, the, uh, the computer program has now labeled that bright star on the edge of Leo the Lion. This is Regulus. Regulus, the front shoulder of Leo the Lion, if you want to imagine it that way. So Leo the Lion in the sky looks like the lions outside the museum. And we are opening on July 1st. Hopefully you'll get a chance to again walk between the lions when you come into the museum. We're pretty excited about that. In terms of viewing Leo in the sky, imagine him laying down, but in this case, he's laying down on a bit of a diagonal with Regulus being his front shoulder. And you can see a triangle of stars up here. This triangle is hind quarters. So he's kind of tipped down this way, out uh, to the right of Regulus, a curved little pattern of stars out here, a backwards question mark, perhaps. This is the head and shoulders of Leo the Lion. Out here, the eye of Leo, his ear is here, he's got a front nose, or the front of his nose right here. This is the mane on the back of his neck. 
regulus on his shoulder, sometimes referred to as his heart as well, and then a star coming down right closer to the horizon, that would be his front paw coming out here. From regulus, go up and to the left, this is the belly of the lion, and then we have the back of the lion, and then this triangle, his hindquarters, you know, just kind of round that out a little bit, and you can perhaps imagine a lion up there. We'll help you out by drawing some constellations on uh, lines on there. You can see all of the constellation lines in view, but you can see Leo the lion positioned here. You can see his body, his hindquarters. Here's his head coming up this way. The star out here to form his leg uh, doesn't actually have a line connected to it, but you can sort of imagine that, I'm sure. So there's Leo the Lion, one of the horoscope for Zodiac constellations. Now we saw the moon, a very, very, very thin crescent. Let's just give you a, a chance to see where it's going to be. This is Tuesday evening, but it does progress a little bit in the sky. So if we go forward to Wednesday evening and then Thursday evening, it actually goes just above Regulus. Now, one of the features of the moon, by the time we get into Wednesday and Thursday evenings, you can see a bit more of its crescent shape. But as we zoom in a little bit tighter to the moon here, you can see the rest of the moon. There is a name for this. It's not just that you can see the rest of the moon. This is sometimes referred to as the old moon in the new moon's arms. The new moon being the crescent portion right here. And the old moon, this dark portion, although it's not completely dark, you can see it. There is some source of light on that. And what is that source of light? Well, think about it this way. If you are on the moon and you're looking up in the sky, what are you going to see? you're going to see the Earth. I mean, we're obviously here on the Earth looking at the moon. You're looking back toward the Earth. You would see the Earth in the sky. And indeed, you would see a bright Earth. The sun would be shining on the clouds and the rest of the surface of the Earth, especially the oceans, reflecting a fair amount of light. And so when the light reflects off the Earth and shines on the moon, that is what kind of lights up this darker section of the moon it's also referred to as earth shine. So something to look for, perhaps on Tuesday night, but uh, I think it'll be a little bit more visible Wednesday and Thursday night. And this is something that's viewable every month. Every time the crescent moon reappears in the Western skies, uh, just after we get to the new moon, you will be able to see this phenomenon. So something to anticipate anytime you see a crescent moon in the skies. Now we're gonna back back out so you can see there's Leo the Lion once again. And let's actually go back to uh, the evening skies for uh, June 23rd. So we just kind of slip it back this way a little bit. So there we have Leo the Lion. So now we're going to take our view back out a little bit farther. We'll let the constellation lines disappear for the moment. And we'll swing over into the southern skies. And very likely what will catch your eye in the southern skies as we get between 9.30 and 10 o'clock is a bright red star coming up. You can see it's labeled here, Antares. If we get it just a bit later, heading toward, say, closer to 10 o'clock tonight, we'll let it pause here. The sky is now fairly dark, and you can see Antares, this red star. This is the heart of the scorpion in the sky. Now, we don't have really scorpions around here, but uh, just to help you imagine it, uh, you can think of perhaps a lobster. That would be just one way to sort of imagine it. But it really involves this creature with these claws out in the front and a long, scaly tail. It actually curls around on the very end of its tail, and scorpions have a stinger on the end of their tail, uh, nothing you want to mess around with. In terms of the sky, though, it's a great, great constellation to view, and it's just coming up this time of year. It's better seen as we get into July and August, but it's certainly worth paying attention to, especially with Antares being one of the brighter stars in the sky, and certainly a noticeable star, one of them to catch your eye pretty easily. So there's Antares. We call it the heart of the scorpion. Not only is it a reddish color, which obviously that would be a, kind of a, a great idea thinking about it as a heart that way, but it's also in the heart of the stars that make Scorpio the scorpion. So imagine if you go from this star out to a vertical line of stars, almost due south at 10 o'clock. 
This represents the head and shoulders of the scorpion. The star in the middle would be the head, on either side would be its shoulders, and you'll just have to imagine a claw extending out here, another claw maybe hooking around this way. Those are the claws of the scorpion. Now if you look to the lower left of the Antares, you can see the rest of the line of Scorpio. Oh, shit. If you look to the lower left of Antares, you can see some other stars here. This forms part of the body of the scorpion, but it does extend right down to the edge of and maybe just a little below the horizon just yet. And so you can see that if I draw the constellation lines on here. In fact, there's another little section of stars right here. This is the stinger on the end of the scorpion's tail. So you can see it's just starting to come up into the skies. But there it is, there's Scorpio, the scorpion, another one of those horoscope or zodiac constellations, a name that's certainly recognizable that way. It is at its best in terms of viewing during the months of July and August, when it's just a little bit higher, especially its tail section in the southern skies. Something else that's showing up, and uh, we'll let this constellation lines disappear, but it's just barely on the left edge of the screen here, a bright star is showing up, so let's kind of bring that into view. It's very low in the southeast. It's not a star, however. This turns out to be the bright planet Jupiter. So Jupiter, which has been out mainly in the late night hours, is now beginning to appear in the evenings. So here we are, it's a little bit after 10 o'clock. It is starting to climb up into the southeastern skies. And over the next uh, several weeks, you'll see it climbing a little bit higher each and every evening. So you'll get some good views of uh, Jupiter, but that's not the only thing that's showing up. Now, we just have to get it a little bit later at night. So again, this is about 10.15. So let's get it a little bit later, say closer to about 10.30. And you can see, quickly on its heels, just coming up, another planet showing up. We have Jupiter located here, certainly brighter, but now Saturn is coming into view. Saturn, not nearly as bright as Jupiter, it's about 10 times fainter than Jupiter. And yet, it's still one of the brighter objects in the sky, it's just that Jupiter is outstandingly bright. Now, the two planets in and of themselves are not all that different. They are large gas giant planets. They are similar in size. Jupiter's slightly larger, but it's not 10 times larger, and yet it's 10 times brighter. Why? Because it is a lot closer to us than Saturn. Distance-wise, Jupiter is approximately 500 million miles away. Saturn is twice the distance, about one billion miles from the Earth. And so the distance is why Saturn appears so much less bright. We can take advantage of this program, Solarium, and zoom in on Jupiter so we can get a better view of it. You can see some information appearing here on the left. Again, this is something that you would see on your own desktop if you use this program. It's called, called Stellarium. But we're going to zoom in on Jupiter now so we can get a closer view of it. This will be sort of like how you might see Jupiter in a backyard telescope. Now, there are a couple of brighter objects appearing near Jupiter. These are some of Jupiter's moons, some of its large moons. They won't actually be this size compared to Jupiter. It's just how the program renders them in terms of being the correct brightness. But as we get closer to Jupiter here, you can see its sort of striped uh, image. This is basically an arrangement of various clouds and cloud types that are on Jupiter. Now here on the Earth, we have one cloud type. It's made of water. But here on Jupiter, there are many different cloud types. There are various compounds involving nitrogen, hydrogen, carbon, and ammonia. Uh, this interesting mix uh, ends up producing lots of different colors, some of which scientists are still working out uh, some of the details. One of the primary features on Jupiter, something that's showing up quite easily here, a large red spot known as truly the giant red spot. That's its name. 
Now, it's often referred to as a storm, although technically, at least from a weather point of view, this is the opposite of a storm. It's an area of higher pressure. It still has a circulation around it. In fact, the winds around the outside of it blow somewhere around 300 miles an hour. It is also very large, just about twice the size of the Earth. So if this is twice the size of the Earth, imagine how large Jupiter is. Jupiter is so large you could put approximately 1,300 Earths inside Jupiter. That's one way to imagine just how large Jupiter is, our largest planet. But here's another interesting fact. If you took all of the planets, you'd have to squish them around and so forth, but if you could take all the other planets and their moons, and they all fit inside Jupiter. Jupiter is enormous compared to uh, the rest of the planets. That's how large it is. All the other planets combined fit inside Jupiter with some, uh, actually, some room to spare. So there's Jupiter showing up quite nicely there. It'll be out throughout the summer and into this fall and even the early part of winter. So we'll bring our view back out. We'll put Jupiter back into its location among the stars here. But just appearing to its lower left is Saturn. And let's take advantage of our program here. And we'll now zoom in on the planet Saturn. And as we do so, of course, what you're looking for are the rings. And again, imagining this as a view through a backyard telescope. Can you see the rings just yet? They're just barely there. Let's move in just a little bit more. It's a very tiny view, and I'm going to leave it there on purpose just for a moment, because this is a good example of what you could expect to see if you were using a backyard telescope to see the planet Saturn. You can see its rings, but they are very tiny. So if, in order to see the Saturn, perhaps the way you imagine it, uh, we have all kinds of great images. Uh, a large telescope might show you something like this, but really, when you're thinking of the view of Saturn, uh, such as we see here, this is what you would see with the Hubble Space Telescope. What we are looking at are, well, some very similar features that we saw on Jupiter. Cloud bands, uh, you can see here on Saturn, but they don't have uh, nearly as many details. One of the reasons, the clouds are moving just that much faster going around Saturn because of their speed. It doesn't permit much in the way of a storm it is to develop. The rings around Saturn are quite large. If you could put the Earth here, just for com uh, comparison, you could put the Earth next to itself five times from the inside edge to the outside edge of the rings. The rings themselves are made of almost pure water, 99.9% .9 water, the other 0.1% various other chemical compounds, but it is nearly all water ice out here on Saturn. You can also see a couple of bright objects out in this area. Much like Jupiter, it does have large moons, and it also has a number of small moons. Both Jupiter and Saturn have at least 70 moons going around them each. So quite a parade of planets, almost like their own mini solar system going around there. I said planets, but I meant moons going around Saturn and Jupiter. We'll bring Saturn back into its location in the skies, and pretty soon we'll see Jupiter joining it. And there it is. Again, they are coming up low in the southeast, and you'll see them best, say, after about 10.30 or so. So there we have some of the early evening planets. So there we have some of the evening planets they are showing up. Of course, evenings are late, so they will be out rather late at night. In fact, they don't get to their highest point in the sky due south until about 2 o'clock in the morning. We're now going to shift our view a little bit more to the east. We're going to take a broader view once again so we can see out a little bit more. And as we swing around into the east, high up in the eastern skies, three stars appear. In fact, if I zoom in just in the right about, there we are. You can see them labeled. Three stars labeled. They are some of the brightest stars in the sky. And the three stars, they obviously form a triangle. It's known as the Summer Triangle. The brightest of the trio, very high in the skies now, is the star Vega. Much lower, toward the southeast, 
the star Altair, and the third star well to the left and dimmer than the other two, the star Deneb. You can see this triangular shape has a little bit of glow inside it, a little bit of fuzziness, a little fuzzy light. Can you see that? It actually extends over to the right of the screen, and in fact, if we shift our view a little bit, it brings us back to a section that we've talked about. There's Antares, that's part of Scorpio, the Scorpion. And below that, there is Jupiter. So the Milky Way runs right down into the southern skies. Now, just on the other side of the Scorpion, this is certainly worth pointing out, so let me just change our view so we can get a slightly better look over here. So we'll bring the Scorpion back into view. But over to its left and right near the Milky Way, a pattern of stars that is sometimes called the teapot. And so let's use a little imagination to see if you can see the teapot. There's a triangle, that's the lid of the teapot. Underneath that is the teapot itself with a handle on the left and a spout sticking out here on the right. Now, if we draw the constellation lines, you will see that pattern, but there are all these funny lines sticking out. And that's because this is actually part of Sagittarius, which is known as the Centaur. In this particular case, the Centaur is also called the Archer. It has a bow and arrow. So imagine a half man, half horse with a bow and arrow. Do you see that there? Probably not. It's a pretty tough thing to imagine. I do. I can tell you this is the bow, for example. This is the hind quarters of the, the centaur, the horse portion of it. This is part of the centaur's arm up here. Making sense of the rest of it? Well, that involves a lot of imagination. So there's the Milky Way, though, that I wanted to mention. We'll let the constellation lines disappear. The Milky Way runs from over here near Sagittarius and Scorpio high into the eastern skies, and so let's bring our view higher into the east. We need to get a broader view so that we can see it. There's the eastern skies, and there we see the stars of the Summer Triangle. And as we curve our way over toward north, you can see we change positions here. There's north and northeast. There's Deneb, part of the Summer Triangle, and there, very faint, you can see part of the Milky Way here. But in that Milky Way, you can see sort of the zigzagger W shape. This is part of Cassiopeia, the queen, the easiest part of her to see, those brighter stars, which if I draw the constellation lines, looks like a zigzag or W shape right in here. Since we're looking in the north, we'll finish up with a view high in the north, where there are two familiar patterns of stars. I'm going to turn the constellation lines off for a moment here, and I think you can easily pick out these stars over here. They're high in the northwest this time of year. This is the handle and the dipper part of the classic pattern of stars we know as the Big Dipper. So there's the dipper part, and you can see its handle. This handle would actually be very close to being overhead for you in the evening skies. The two stars on the outer edge of the dipper, we can draw some constellation lines so you can see this pattern of stars. There's the Big Dipper, part of the Great Bear in the sky. But if you extend that line to the right, you can see a bright star showing up here. That is the North Star. If we just shift our view just slightly here so we can bring North into view, you can see the North Star is exactly above North. It is the end of the handle of the Little Dipper. You can see the different pattern here. There's the handle part and there is the Dipper. So there we have kind of a quick view of the evening skies that you can see this time of year during late June. As we get into July, more and more we'll be featuring the planets of Jupiter and Saturn, and we'll get better views of things like Sagittarius and Scorpio, as well as the Summer Triangle. So I hope you join us in the coming weeks from the Lyman Spitzer Junior Planetarium online.